Well, good morning. Welcome to the morning service. Trust that the Lord has been kind to you and gracious to you in the days that have gone since we were last able to meet like this. As we begin this morning, I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 21 and from verse 22. John wrote, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So reads God's word. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you this morning for all your grace and your mercy towards us. We thank you that it is by grace we have been saved. We realize as we come into your presence this morning, we did not deserve salvation. There was nothing in us that merited that we should be made right with you. There was no means by which we had earned the right to come into your presence. Rather, by nature and birth, we were sinners. We were rebels against you, for you are the Holy One, pure and clean. You are lovely without any shadow of turning. There is no unholiness, nothing which is distasteful and wrong, nothing which is corrupt, nothing which is devious, not even in the slightest regard. You are holy, you are righteous, you are pure and clean, the altogether lovely one. You are the one who reigns in majesty so that the presence of your person is utterly overwhelming. And indeed, in our natural state, we would be overwhelmed should we stand in your full, immediate, unveiled presence. And yet we thank you that it is by grace you have saved us, not because we deserved it or had earned it, but out of sovereign love and grace and mercy, you sent our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to die in our place, to bear the weight of our sin and our guilt, and to deal with it once and for all in his body on the cross. And we thank you that by his resurrection, we have been made right with you, the living God. And so we are able to come before your throne of grace into the very holiest of all with boldness this morning and make our prayers before you, in your presence, knowing that the Holy Spirit is amongst us. So we thank you that though we are dispersed at this time, yet we're able to draw together as one now as we worship you. So Lord, we pray that we will know your presence and your help. Help us, Lord, we pray as we read through the words of these grand old hymns of the past to focus our hearts and minds upon you and to see the relevance of the words for our own experience and life, even this day. And Lord, especially as we draw to your word, may you, by the Holy Spirit, open your word to us. May the Spirit apply these things in our lives and may we be found obedient to your voice. So Lord, hear and answer prayer for your name's sake. Amen. The hymn that we are starting with this morning isn't found in Christian hymns. 
It's found in a number of books. I've taken it from Redemption Hymnal, but it was Fred who asked for this, and he found it in the Keswick Hymn Book. And it's There is Life. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sin a look unto him and be saved, unto him who was nailed to the tree. Look, look, look and live. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Oh, why was he there as a bearer of sin, if on Jesus thy sins were not laid? Oh, why from his side flowed the sin-cleansing blood, if his dying thy debt has not paid? It is not thy tears of repentance nor prayers, but the blood that atones for the soul. On him then believe. And a pardon receive, for his blood can now make thee quite whole. We are healed by his stripes. Wouldst thou add to the word? And he is our righteousness made. The best robe of heaven he bids thee to wear. Oh, couldst thou be better arrayed? Then doubt not thy welcome, since God has declared there remaineth no more to be done that once in the end of the world he appeared and completed the work he begun. But take with rejoicing from Jesus at once the life everlasting he gives. And know with assurance thou never canst die since Jesus thy righteousness lives. Look, look, look and live. There is life at a look. At the crucified one there is life at this moment for thee. Well, let's bow our heads again in prayer and seek the Lord's help for those who stand in particular need this day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that when we have trusted in you that we know true life everlasting. And yet we thank you that being a child of yours, being a Christian saved by grace is not simply an otherworldly matter, but you are with us in the here and now and you care for us and provide for us. You lead us and you comfort us and rebuke us and strengthen us and correct us and enable us. We thank you for all of that. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit by which this is done. Lord, we pray for those of this fellowship who stand in a very real need this day. We pray for all of those in particular who will be going out to work and, and have to go out into the community. Lord, the nurses and for those who are in the emergency services and others who have to go out and do essential work, Lord, we pray your hand would be upon them. Keep them safe. Grant to them a graciousness in all that they do and a peace of heart and mind that surpasses all human understanding. Lord, may their hearts and minds be stayed on you and therefore held firm and secure. Keep them, Lord, we pray, for some will be seeing things they never thought to see in their working life. And Lord, we pray, therefore, that they will know a double portion of your grace at this time. Lord, we pray for those amongst our fellowship who are more elderly, those who perhaps are finding this time a struggle cut off from friends and family, fellowship we pray you'll have your hand upon them we pray for those lord like fred and for jack and for others lord in the fellowship who need to know your presence and your closeness and your help keep them strong and healthy at this time keep them safe lord we pray and may they above all know that fellowship that presence of your spirit lord we pray too for other fellowships round and about us we Think of our brothers and our sisters in this wider area. We think of the fellowship in Shrewsbury and then again in Wellington and up the road in Stafford, down the way in, in Dudley. And Lord, we pray wherever your people are found that they will know your presence, your help, your undertaking. And Lord, we pray especially for our own city. We pray for those who are our neighbours about us. We ask that at this time that they will be given cause to pause to think and to consider the true meaning of life and where hope really lies. And Lord, we pray you will help to open their eyes and draw them. Lord, may we then be found to be faithful witnesses of you. Lord, may we preach the gospel, that gospel which alone gives true hope. And may you be glorified as it is heard and received and applied by the Spirit and those who should be are drawn and saved.
So, Lord, hear and answer prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the authorities you have placed over us. We pray that they will be enabled to rule us peaceably and wise and sensibly. We ask, Lord, that you will fully restore the Prime Minister, that you will have your hand upon the royal family at this time. And, Lord, we ask above all things that you will be magnified and glorified. Now, as always, for your name's sake and according to your word, we ask these things. Amen. Well, we are turning this morning to the Old Testament, to Job and chapter 19. Job and chapter 19. We will read from the beginning of the chapter. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have reproached me. You are not ashamed that you have wronged me. And if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. If indeed you exalt yourselves against me and plead my disgrace against me, Know then that God has wronged me and has surrounded me with his net. If I cry out concerning wrong, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is no justice. He has fenced up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness in my paths. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. My hope he has uprooted like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me, and he counts me as one of his enemies. His troops come together and build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed and my close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. And I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. I arise. And they speak against me. All my close friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my flesh, to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. If you should say, how shall we persecute him, since the root of the matter is found in me, be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. So reads the Lord's word to us. We are coming to chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. What do you know? These are, of course, very special verses. They are often rightly read, particularly at the funeral of a Christian who's gone to be with the Lord. They are words that bring us great comfort as the Lord's people. They are also the words that form the basis of a very famous aria from Handel's oratorio, Messiah. It was an oratorio, uh, an aria rather, that my father was very fond of. So these verses have a certain personal edge for me as well. I want us to start by asking, or by seeing rather, where Job was at in life. These verses are a vibrant testimony of a child of God, in this case, Job. 
Job had suffered a whole series of calamities that he at this point in his life did not understand. We are given the background to them in the opening couple of chapters, but Job was ignorant of these things at the time. He only knew that these terrible calamities came to him in life. He had lost his business, his wealth, his money, his home, his family, his health, and then finally his own wife turned on him and urged him to curse God and die. That amounts to suicide. Then his friends came. And they sit and for seven days mourn with him in silence. That's the sign of a good friend. When Job finally breaks the silence and expresses the depth of then his personal despair, they, they try to explain things to Job. And they try to explain to Job that it must be because he's committed some gross sin of which he has not repented. And God has brought all these calamities on him as a result. They had no idea that the Lord had, yes, indeed brought this on Job through the agency of Satan so as to prove Job in the fiery trial. Job was indeed the Lord's champion. Now, by this 19th chapter, Job says in verse 2, he feels as though his friend's words have broken him in pieces. There's that old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, names will never hurt me. Well, these words had broken him in pieces, he says. They were so convinced he had sinned and hence the punishment. Job replies that if it is punishment in verse 6, then God has wronged me. Now, perhaps he's overstepped the mark there. You see, the Lord had decreed this time of suffering for Job. And there was a sense in which his friends were quite right about that. All our sinners, all of us deserve the judgment of God. Yet both Job's friends and Job himself were wrong. The Lord had allowed and even caused this time for his own purposes and his own glory. Job was only too well aware of the things he had lost, that he had lost the respect of others that he had lost the care of others, his maidservant, his, his servants don't answer him. Even in my breath, he says, is offensive to my wife. She wants me to die. There's almost a note of despair in this chapter in Job's voice. He knows he's under the hand of God. He, he, he can see and he mourns what he's lost. And so he says something in verse 20 that has become a standard stock saying in the English language. He says, I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Now, most of us will never descend into the depths that Job experienced here. And for that, we should be grateful to the Lord. Yet many or most of us will experience in our life times when perhaps we feel a little more down than others. Perhaps we even feel a little depressed and sad. Without doubt, there are many, perhaps even of us today, who are struggling a little as this lockdown continues for another three weeks. And some, perhaps, of you don't see another person to speak to from one end of the week to the other. And you feel a bit of loneliness. Yes, you can have the phone call and you have the letter and the text. But life for some in our communities has become lonely and has become, therefore, a little harder. Perhaps for that reason or for any other number of reasons, you are perhaps mentally or emotionally not in a good place this morning. And you can find yourself identifying with Job's words. And you're saying, these things have broken me to pieces. I just feel like I'm getting by by the skin of my teeth. Well, if that's you, then what follows is very much for you. If you were a child of God, what Job has to, said, has to say should strike deeply into your heart and soul this morning. You see, for all that Job was struggling in so many ways, there was one pure, perfect beam of light in his life. And the darker things seemed to get, the brighter that light shone. And what you need today is to focus on that same light. So let's move now on to who Job knew. 
You see, this light in Job's life, despite all his mourning, despite the bleakness, the despair almost of his heart, this light didn't come from a clever philosophical way of viewing life which enabled him to deal with life's problems. It wasn't that Job needed lots of counseling. It wasn't about what, but who Job knew. Because it seems almost in verse 23 that Job has a complete change of course. He seems to be heading in one way towards the rocks of despair and suddenly he has turned at a sharp angle and he is sailing out into the broad ocean where the sun shines. And he has a new confidence it seems. But he is drawing us to the one whom he knows. Look in verses 23 and 24. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. What a book he talks about. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. He has this confidence. He wants his words to stand the test of time. But you see, Job hasn't changed at all. What we are seeing is the ground now upon which he is resting. Yes, he may feel down. He may be in mourning for his loss. He may be keenly aware of the state into which he has been brought. And he doesn't really understand why any of it has happened yet. And yet here he has the ground of his life, the ground of his assurance, and it is the person Job knows. And the opening line of verse 25 then is this great testimony about the person Job knew. For I know, says Job, with an absolute certainty, for I know there's no wavering, there's no doubting. His circumstances didn't change his view. His losses didn't change anything. He knew whatever else happened, this was solid ground, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, when he speaks of his Redeemer here, the root word that is used is Gwa'al, to redeem. And it is closely related to Goel, the Redeemer kinsman. And it is God then who is the Redeemer of Job, it is God who is the redeemer of his people throughout the Old Testament. And so when we read in verse 26 uh, that Job goes on to say of his redeemer in my flesh, I shall see God, it's no surprise to us. Job has this absolute confidence in God, the bedrock of his life, his God. He, his whole life rests on God as his redeemer. As such, God has brought him back. He has dealt with his sin. It is sin that his friends are constantly throwing in his face. Your sin must be great. But Job's testimony is that God is his redeemer, has dealt with his sin. And God has brought Job into a right relationship with himself. And so Job is convinced that on a human level, God will redeem him out of his present situation. So Job is relying upon God. No other could have redeemed him and no other would have redeemed him. Only the living God is his redeemer. That's who Job knew. That's where Job was resting. That was the bedrock of his life. Now, without a shadow of doubt here, Job is looking forward in some respect to the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 11.39 tells us that none of the Old Testament saints received the promise. In other words, the Messiah didn't come in their day. The Messiah's work wasn't accomplished in their day. The work of redemption wasn't done. God having provided something better for us, says Hebrews 11.40, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. But now the Redeemer has come, the Redeemer kinsman. Our Savior God, he has come, the God-man, Christ Jesus, our Lord, the Redeemer. And ultimately, he is the one in whom Job here is resting. This same Lord Jesus Christ, the one true and living God. The only Redeemer. And it should prompt us this morning to ask, who am I trusting in? 
You noticed how quickly all our lives have changed over the last month. Our lives have changed from deciding we're going to go for a day out and we'll drive 100, 150 miles and go and take in a few sights and have some food and come back late in the evening to how far can we walk or cycle in an hour for some exercise. So much has changed and there's a lesson there for us. If we are trusting in the things of this world, how quickly they can disappear on us. You see, there is nothing in this world's goods and things that can do you eternal good. You can have all the benefits and the pleasures and the, 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 the things that this world approves of. And they will not stand the test of eternity. But the Redeemer can do you eternal good. And if, like Job, you are not standing on the bedrock of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not looking to him as Redeemer and God, you have no real basis for hope at all this morning. Your only hope is in the things of this world which can so easily dribble away from us. Jesus Christ alone is the Redeemer who by faith Job looked to. He's the one who came and died for sinners like you and me. He's the only Savior who can save you from your sin and its consequences. There is no other. Only he can make you right with God. Only he can bring you back into a right relationship with God and bring you back from that kingdom of darkness into his own kingdom, making you a child of God instead of a, 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 a son of wrath. Now a child of God. You see, the things which this world holds dear can be taken away and lost so quickly. You can never, however, lose what the Redeemer does for you. Once he has dealt with your sin, once he, he has pleaded his righteousness and his blood before the Father, once the finished work has been applied to you, you are saved, not just for a day or for a year or for life, but for eternity. Though all this world's goods and privileges are lost, Yet with Job you can say, I know that my Redeemer lives. My friend, if you are not sure this morning, you need to make sure. You need to trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. You need to be saved. You need to be trusting in Him as Redeemer. Be redeemed by the Redeemer. Trust in Him by faith this morning. Job knew God was his Redeemer. And then I want us to see what Job knew. Because what Job knew should thrill your heart if you're a Christian. If this doesn't thrill your heart, then you need to get on your knees and spend time before the Lord in reality this morning. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. You see, Job here has a hope which stretches beyond his present troubles. It's a hope which involved the Lord being present in some manner on the very ground in which he now sat in his misery. And it's a hope which then becomes very much clearer in verse 26. He says, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. In a sense, now all that was left of Job was his skin and that was riddled by boils as he sat on the ground. So when Job speaks of his skin being destroyed, he is speaking of his death. He is riddled with boils, he is racked with pain, he has suffered the loss of everything. And now he seems to be looking to what may have seemed to him to be his inevitable death. That's all that's left to come is to die. And then he knew his body would suffer the corruption of the grave. And yet, he says, in my flesh, in this body of mine, I will see God. Even though thy flesh has been destroyed and my body has gone into the ground and suffered corruption, yet in my flesh I will see God. This is a hope that goes far beyond the end of his temporal misery. Job had a, a, a hope that stretched far beyond the end of his temporary pain and hurt, stretched out into eternity because of who his Redeemer was. 
God, you see, had given him an assurance of eternal life. He knew that the death and that the grave was not the end for him. He might suffer so terribly, he might die, yet he knew there was a life to come, and he was so very sure. Oh, he only glimpsed a little of the light of the Savior down through the intervening centuries. Yet he knew that eternal life was his in the Redeemer. What a, a solid and sure hope he has here of eternal life, that he would see God. He would see the invisible. He would see him who is spirit. He would see him who is glorious. He would see him in his flesh. He would see him. Bodily, he would be with the Lord. What a hope of eternal life was this man's then. What a grand hope he has. It's sobering, isn't it, to think not just in this nation, but worldwide of so many in the last couple of months who have gone into eternity. And as Christians, we know that God has set eternity in our hearts. We know that the grave isn't the end. And now that we are in Christ, we know that we have eternal life in him. And this period then is a reminder to us of the urgency of the task at hand. We are called to be witnesses to the grace of God in the gospel. We are called to go to those who are lost and say there is good news, there is hope in Christ. Perhaps we haven't done it before. We've always left it to somebody else. Leave it to the team that goes into the open air. Leave it to the team that goes into the, the care home. Leave it to the youth workers. Leave it to those who, who seem to be good at it. Leave it to the professionals. Christian, you are called to be a witness. And we need to start being witnesses today if we've never done it before. We need to find a way to tell others, be it ever so simple. We need to find a way. Because we have a hope that is glorious. We have a hope that is sure. You see, eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer and God, that is ours. And we can look beyond the, bond, the bounds of this life. And we can see that which is yet to come. And we see him who is our sure Redeemer, our Savior and God. And Scripture leaves us in no doubt about it. You go to the end of that little letter of Jude, and there we have that grand axology. Now unto him who was able to present us without fault, without falling, before the presence of his glory. And we are told there the, saviors will, the Savior will present us before the Father as part of his church's bride, and he'll do that with exceeding joy, with joy which overflows, with a fullness of gladness of heart. And then on that day, we will be clean and pure and holy. We read it earlier in Revelation 22. A day will come, we will see our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, face to face. Face to face with him who died for us. Face to face with the Savior and our Lord. What then of the things of this world? What if we have climbed the tree of our career? What if we've got to the top? What if we've accumulated great wealth in this world? What of it? Would be, we be ashamed to stand before him because we kept the greatness of the gospel to ourselves? We shall see him face to face. What a hope is ours. What a joy is ours that we will see our saviour. And though we die, yes, and our bodies go into the ground for sure, yet in the resurrection body that will be ours, we will see him face to face. What Job only barely understand, understood, we have explained in full measure in Scripture. Read 1 Corinthians 15 for yourself later. 
and see the glory of the resurrection body that will be ours, that body in which we will see our Savior face to face when we stand in the new heavens and the new earth, in the very glorious presence of our sovereign and triune God. Why? Why is it so? Because the Lord is risen, of course. And because he is alive, we will know that physical resurrection to eternal life as well. Scripture says he is the first fruit from the dead. And because he is the first, we too must rise in him. And because he is alive, we will live because of him. Now, Christian, if that isn't an encouragement at this time, there can be no encouragement for you. Because what a prospect is laid before us as children of God to see him to be with him physically, to be in his presence for eternity. I would say to you this morning, dwell on that. Think on that. Switch the news off. Give it a rest for a day. And think on this prospect that is laid before you. Read through these verses again. Read through Revelation 21 and 22. Read through 1 Corinthians 50. And think on these things. Think on the prospect of seeing your Redeemer God. And let that be an encouragement to your heart. What Job knew. And then finally, I want us to see Job's certain future. In verse 27, Job says he will see God bodily in his flesh. He says, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall be whole and not another. Job then knew it to be a full, true, sure, and certain end for the child of God. With his own eyes, he would see his Redeemer and his God. This wouldn't be a vision. This wouldn't be a fading mental aberration as he went into the darkness of an eternal night never to know consciousness again. This wouldn't be a piece of wishful thinking to keep him and yet would prove empty at the last. This was something which Job knew was sure, certain that this was to be a physical reality. He speaks of his own flesh, his own body. He speaks of his own eyes. Those eyes that we used to see now would see then perfectly his Redeemer God. There would be no other who would take his place. He wouldn't see him by proxy. Not as we are this morning. You see me through a camera lens. But now Job says, I will see him face to face. Not somebody in my place. I will be there. You see, Job had had been redeemed by grace and he was sure and knew for a certainty that God would bring him into his presence forever. His future was assured. It was Job's certain future. And then Job says something that is quite incredible. How my heart yearns within me. This wasn't a passing fancy for Job. There are people now who are saying, I can't wait to get out of this lockdown. But a year after it's gone, it'll be just a memory for us, a passing memory. But this wasn't a passing fancy for Job. This was more sure and certain than life itself. This was more real to this man than those things around him. He sat in a puddle of misery and despair, having lost everything that life counts dear. And yet, he was more sure of seeing the Lord for himself than anything. He sat on the ground under the pitying gaze of his friends, trying to convince him that he had committed a terrible sin for which God was judging him. And yet, Job has this absolute assurance so that he yearns to see the Lord. He yearns for that day when he'll be with the Lord forever. Yes, even as he went on to warn his friends of the awful reality of the judgment of God in verses 28 and 29, he could speak of yearning for the day he would be with the Lord. It's almost as though he is saying, oh, to be with him for eternity. 
Oh, for the day when I will stand before the Lord in this body of mine and see the Lord who has redeemed me. I will see him with my own eyes. To be so privileged, says Job. Perhaps like me, at times you've looked at photographs of famous places, places you'd like to go to. Perhaps you've looked at the square of St. Mark's in Venice. Or you've looked at the Julian Forum in Rome. And you've said, I'd love to be there. And if you've achieved it, and you've seen something with your own eyes that man has created, which is beautiful and wonderful, perhaps, but now is behind you. Yet to have this as our great end. To long for this more than anything else. Job knew this was something that wasn't passing in ephemeral, but would be true for all of eternity without end. When he saw the Lord, it wouldn't be just a a fleeting glimpse. I saw the Queen of England once. I was about six rows back as she walked past very quickly. Back in 1977. But I saw her. A fleeting glimpse. No, no. Not a fleeting glimpse of our God and Savior. We will be in the presence of our Redeemer God forever. No wonder he longed for this more than life itself. So it's right here that Job challenges us as Christians in the 21st century. We live in an age of plenty. And we don't even realize it. We have things that our forefathers couldn't even be Begin to imagine we have so much. We have so much, I fear, we don't yearn for what Job yearned. And remember, Job had only the smallest of glimpses of the gospel. He saw only a fraction of Christ and what he would accomplish. And yet Job was so sure, so certain of his future. Yes, we can look back and see all that Christ did. We can see the cross where he paid the price of our sin, where that penalty that should have been paid by us was laid on him. And yes, we can see that empty tomb and the eyewitnesses who met with the risen Lord and we can see the reality of his resurrection. And we can see the ascension of our Lord and we can see him seated in glory on the right hand of the majesty on high, seated in glory until he returns in power and glory. But do we yearn for that day? Do we dwell on that? Does it affect our thinking? Does it affect the way we live day by day? I fear that the answer for most of us is no. I fear that we may have become so wedded to this world that there is only this world for us. And we are terrified that we may lose it. Christian, let me tell you this. You will lose this world. Because this world is not your home. But Christian, your future, my future is so certain. Paul could speak of this. He speaks of this in Philippians 1. He could say that he had a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. No, he wasn't courting death. He wasn't seeking suicide. But he knew that when he passed from this veil of dying into that land of the living, as Courtney reminded us on Tuesday, is far better. It's far better to be in the land of the living with the Savior God, to be in his eternal presence forever. That's what Paul wanted. What could be better? To lose this world of sin and decay, yes. To gain that eternal weight of glory in the presence of our sovereign Savior and Redeemer. To gain that which can never be lost. To lose the the paltry sum of moldering worth. To gain that of infinite worth which can never be measured. And on the Savior's return in power and glory... We will gain it in resurrection bodies. We will be raised and our bodies will be changed. We will be suited for the immediate presence and eternal glory of the triune God on the new earth forever. Christian, this is your future. You will see it with your own eyes. Nobody will take your place. 
Do you believe it even? Really? Do you yearn for this? Do you long for this? Or is it something you hold only in the lightest possible manner? It's like being at the beach and you pick a handful of sand up but your fingers are open and it dribbles through so that at the end there's almost nothing left. Is it something that is just a vague idea to you? But you've been too busy living for today for it to be an absolute reality in your mind. Those who've gone before us in the faith had a much clearer view of eternity than we do. They had a much clearer view of what was coming. They dwelt more on eternity and eternal things. It's high time we spent time meditating upon our Savior's glory and our sure end with him in the glory to come. We read it at the beginning. From the hymn writer, but take with rejoicing from Jesus at once the life everlasting he gives, and know with assurance thou never canst die since Jesus thy righteousness lives. We need to contemplate that day when we will never die. Revelation 21 says that the the dwelling place of God is with man, and that day there will be no more death, no more parting, no more tears, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Behold, I make all things new, says the Lord. This is our end, Christian. Do we yearn for this, our sure and certain future? Can I encourage you to take time today to sit still? And in the days to come, sit still and think a great deal about this. And then we will begin to live to the glory of our risen and glorious Savior today, in this life and forever. May it be so to the praise of his eternal name. Amen. Well, as we come to a close, I want to read the words of 812. These were words written by Vernon Hyam. He was very ill. And this hymn speaks of that experience and how the Lord drew close to him in that time. I saw a new vision of Jesus, a view I had not seen here before. Beholding in glory so wondrous with beauty I had to adore. I stood on the shores of my weakness and gazed at the brink of such fear. It was then that I saw him in newness, regarding him fair and so dear. My Savior will never forsake me, unveiling his merciful face, his presence and promise almighty, redeeming his loved ones by grace. In shades of the valley's dark terror, where hell and its horror hold sway, my Jesus will reach out in power and save me by his only way. For yonder a light shines eternal, which spreads through the valley of gloom. Lord Jesus, resplendent and regal, drives fear far away from the tomb. Our God is the end of the journey. His pleasant and glorious domain. For there are the children of mercy who praise him for Calvary's pain. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, We thank you for the glorious certainty that is ours in our Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that because he died to pay the price of our sin and rose for our justification and has ascended to your right hand, that through faith in him and repentance of sin, we can be sure of eternal life so that this world is not all there is. This world is not our end. But a day is coming when we will raise bodily and we will be with you in your presence forever in the new heavens and the new earth. And on that day we will see you for ourselves with our own eyes. O Lord, teach us afresh and anew what it is to truly yearn for these things, to long for them. Lord, may we dwell on these things so much more than we have. Forgive us, Lord, that we are so wedded to this world Lord, may you help us to truly be citizens of heaven 
and so be more useful to you. Lord, go with us now and keep us, and to you be all the honor, praise, and the glory, now and forever. Amen.